Good morning, everybody. Welcome to my backyard today. We are in Exodus chapter 17 today. Now, if you remember, chapter 16 ended um, right after the children of Israel were traveling through the wilderness of sin after they crossed the Red Sea and they were hungry and the Lord miraculously gave them bread from heaven in the form of manna and he brought quail into the land so they were fed supernaturally all right now this chapter picks up their journey there and in verse 1 of chapter 17 it says and all the congregation of the children of israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Now the issue before was food. Now it's water. Okay? Um, now, <laughs> we just need to remember here, in our own lives, that following the Lord doesn't necessarily mean that there's not going to be any problems. Quite the contrary. Sometimes there's more problems. Uh, because this gives the enemy reason to attack us, right? <laughs> if we belong to the Lord, he has reason to come after us with all kinds of different situations and problems. But in all those situations, when things like that happen, our faith is tried for the glory of God, ultimately. And in those situations after the fact you know we can look back on them and say yeah the Lord brought me through this trial right here and and it's easy to see now why that happened because it caused me to do such and such right when we're in the trials we can't really see that it's usually afterwards and looking back on the situation but there was no water for the people to drink there in Rephidim where they were staying Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? All right, now the word chide, that's an old English word that's fallen out of use like many of the others that are used in the King James Version. But all that meant was to complain or to challenge. So they were uh, challenging Moses in a way, and they were saying, okay, uh, you did these other things, or caused the Lord to do these things, and it's not really sure where the belief of the majority of the people were. Uh, I'm sure some of them certainly believed the Lord. Okay, but there was a certain amount of them that didn't, and that's what we gather from the text here. It's kind of like they were putting Moses on the spot, and they thought that he was maybe all these things were happening by him, that he was performing some kind of trick or magic or something. All right, so they come after him, and and he says, "Why are you confronting me about this? Why do you tempt the Lord?" In other words, don't you think that he's going to take care of the situation? And of course, he would have. If they hadn't complained, they would have been given water to drink anyway, I'm sure. But they seem really demanding here. And then in verse 3, it says, And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses. And what that means is that they, they talked behind his back. They murmured against him. And said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? So here, they're doing it again. They're doing it again. They're, they're accusing Moses of bringing them out there to kill them. Well, if they were out there to be killed, uh, like we said before, 
God could have easily killed them in the Red Sea along with the Egyptians, you know? So, where's their faith? It just goes right out the window that fast. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. <laughs> He's crying out to the Lord here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river. In Egypt, remember, he struck the river with his uh, rod, and it turned to blood. He says, And thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thy hand, and go. First of all, the Lord is so gracious here. Uh, the people are challenging him. And there's more than likely a lot of them that don't believe that it's God. They think that, uh, you know, m maybe Moses and Aaron are, are putting them on. Um, I know, it's hard to believe how they could think that because there is a pillar of cloud that's leading them by day and it's a pillar of fire at night. Uh, you know, how would Moses be able to manufacture that and the parting of the Red Sea and all these miraculous things that have happened but still it's human nature to doubt I guess <laughs> and that's definitely what they were doing but the Lord is so gracious in all of it because even though they come against him like that uh, they, he still supplies for them in Matthew chapter 5 verse 44 the Lord said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So he's just making an example here also as that we should follow his example. Because even though they were coming against him and accusing him of all these things, he was still going to help them because they were his children. He chose them out. Uh, he called them his firstborn, uh, the apple of his eye. And he had plans. He had plans with them, which they really didn't know anything about at this time. Of course, we know about it now. He planned to come into the world himself through their line. Verse 6. Behold. Now, this is still the Lord talking to Moses here. He says, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. All right? Now, notice that it says that he would stand on the rock. God says, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. So he says that he's going to be standing on the rock while Moses strikes it. The Lord wanted to bring water, miraculously, uh, because he wanted to show them that it was him that was providing for them. Now, I'm going to show a picture here. This is the rock that is there in the desert in Saudi Arabia it's called the Rock of Horeb and this is right there uh, near the foot of Mount Horeb where and this is supposedly where Moses struck the rock and notice how it split down the middle and they have even found evidence of water that water was running out of this rock <laughs> so it's conjectured that this is the actual rock that Horeb, that Moses struck, that water came out of. It doesn't describe it a whole lot in this passage here, but in Psalm 78, verses 15 and 16, in talking about this incident, it says, He clave the rocks in the wilderness. Now, as you've seen in the picture there, the rock there is split in the middle. It's cloven. He clave the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink as out of the great depths. So a lot of water came out of it. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like rivers. 
It was a lot of water. Well, there was millions of people there, and they had they had herds and flocks and everything that needed to drink also. There was no water at all. And in Psalm 114, verse 8, it talks about it there too. In verse 8, it says, which turned the rock into a standing water, the flint into a fountain of waters. Okay? So it was a little more descriptive about it there. It wasn't just a little bit of water, a little fountain of water coming out of the rock. There was a lot of water. I assume it was gushing out from, you know, under the ground there. Now, one thing that I wanted to bring to your attention here is the fact that Moses was told to strike the rock. All right. Now, this is symbolic of the Lord himself. The Lord said that he would stand on the rock. And Moses was told to strike the rock, which is kind of a, a symbolism there of, of the Lord being struck, which he was. He was crucified, and then that was done for us. <laughs> These spiritual rivers of living water that he pours out for us are through his cross and through his persecution. So this is also a type of Christ being struck. Is the rock being struck? Verse 7, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? See? They were doubting him there. Now the word Massa... That means temptation. They were tempted there to challenge the Lord, which is what they were doing. And Meribah, which he called it also, that means contention or strife. And they were actually questioning the Lord's existence there. When they said, is the Lord among us or not? They were questioning his existence. They were, they were putting Moses on the spot here, thinking that they could trip him up. And that's just the that's just the uh, the nature of people to think in a natural way, you know. To think, well, this couldn't be a miracle, you know. There's no miracles. There has to be a natural explanation for it. That's what they were thinking. Like I said, I'm sure it wasn't all of them, but some of them were thinking that. Verse eight. Then came Amalek. All right, now, here the story changes completely. Chapter 17 isn't a very long chapter, really. But there's two major stories in it. Uh, the first one is what we just finished there, which was the waters that came out of the rock miraculously. And now this is the second one. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Okay? Now, the Amalekites were descended from Esau's grandson, Amalek. Okay? Uh, now remember that, that Jacob took the birthright and the blessing from Esau. Okay? So the Israelites here are all descended from Jacob. The Amalekites are all descended from Esau. So this is an ancient feud that had been going on. And this goes back a couple hundred years to the time of Jacob and Esau, which was oh, probably 200, 250 years before this time here. Another point of interest here is that this is Israel's first battle in coming out of Egypt. They didn't have to fight the Egyptians at all. The Lord did that for them. So this is the first time that... Uh, an army or somebody else came up against them. Now, they were prepared. They went out as an army, and I'm sure that they had weapons with them. Um, Amalek started the battle, and we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 and 18, when Moses is recounting in the book of Deuteronomy the things that they'd been through. He said, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when ye were come forth out of Egypt, 
how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee. The hindmost, which would have been the ones that were in the back of the group of people that were moving through the desert. He met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. All right. Now these Amalekites, they knew that these were the descendants of Jacob, their enemy, the enemy of Esau, Esau's brother, who stole the birthright and the blessing from him. So they were against the children of God here, against Israel, and they attacked the rear flanks of them where the slower and the elderly were at. Okay? So they initiated the fight. And it says that they feared not God. All right, now back back to Exodus here. Verse 9. And Moses said unto Joshua. This is the first time in Scripture that Joshua is mentioned. Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. All right. Who was Hur? <laughs> we don't really know for sure. Uh, there are several other mentions of him in Scripture. I believe it's in First Chronicles. I didn't make a note of it here, but it's in either First or Second Chronicles. Probably First Chronicles. It mentions Hur... And it says that he is the father of Caleb, who comes into the story later on, when they first get to the promised land. So one idea is that he is the father of Caleb. Now another idea has been that he is Moses' brother-in-law. So by the three of them going up there, it was representing their family. There was Moses, his brother Aaron, and Hur, who suggested that this was Miriam's husband. So Hur would have been Moses and Aaron's brother-in-law, if that's the case. I don't know what, why they think that, because I don't see any evidence of that. But it's not really known for sure exactly who he was. He was from the tribe of Judah. We do know that. Verse 11, And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. Okay, this is during the battle. He told Joshua to go and fight with Amalek, so this battle is going on. And Moses and Aaron and Hur are on top of the hill. But it says that when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. It's a lot of symbolism in that, too. Verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Moses holding up the rod. And I'm sure that during the battle, they could look up and they could see him standing on the hill. So it was like a type of flag or a banner to them. Okay? It gave the army confidence while they were fighting to look up there and see their leader holding up the rod of God, which he had used to perform so many miracles. So it gave the fighting men confidence when they looked up there and they seen Moses up there holding that rod up like that. But at the same time, it was also an appeal to God. It was a banner for the fighting men, but it was also an appeal to God. He was crying out to God. He was on the rock, which symbolizes the Lord. And he was appealing with two other people. 
It's just, it's symbolic of prayer and petition to the Lord. In Matthew 18, verses 19 through 20, the Lord says, Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Well, there were three of them, right? He was holding up that rod, which symbolizes the power of God. He was making his appeal to the Lord that the children of Israel would prevail in this battle. And there's Aaron and Hur on either side of him, agreeing with it by holding his arms up for him. So anyway, there's a lot of symbolism in that whole thing there. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now the word discomfit, that's not really used anymore either. But all that means is to defeat in battle. So it means that Joshua defeated Amalek in this battle. Now, a little bit about Joshua here. Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. And in the story here, and in many stories with Joshua throughout the book of Joshua, Joshua is like a type of Christ. When I say a type of, that means um, he was a precursor and kind of a shadow of what would come to be. All right? There's a lot of things in the Old Testament like that. There are stories for our uh, comfort and for our admonition and, and a lot of things like that, but they are also symbolic of greater spiritual truths. And this is one of them. Uh, he's a type of Christ, and he even has the same name. Joshua, which is Yehoshua. And what it means is Yahweh, or Yehovah, or Jehovah, however you want to say that, is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. That's what the name Joshua means, and it's the same as the name of Jesus. It's Yeshua, Yehushua, <laughs> in the Hebrew. Now, of course, Jesus is the Greek pronunciation of the same name. It's Ye Yehushua or something like that in the Hebrew, and then in the Greek, it's Jesus or Aesis, because the J wasn't pronounced back at that time. Anyway... That's another thing there, is that it is the same name, and he's mighty in battle. Joshua was a mighty in battle. Uh, in going into the promised land, and you see all about this, the, the wars in the book of Joshua, how they went in and they, they defeated all of the enemies, all of the, uh, the different tribes there that were, uh, they were pagan people. <laughs> they were evil people. A lot of them were giants. But these people were defeated. So likewise, in battle, in spiritual battle, the Lord Jesus is our champion. And we see him as a warrior at many times. The Lord is a warrior. He is a man of war, which it said a few chapters ago. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, the Apostle Paul says about Jesus, it says that he spoiled principalities and powers, and he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He's defeated the, the enemy, the forces of Satan. They have been defeated by him. Hallelujah. Okay, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. The interesting part of that verse right there is that Moses is told to write it in a book and to record it. That's the first time that you hear that in Scripture. 
the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. All right, now here's another name of God. And what this means is the Lord is my banner. Jehovah Nisi. It means the Lord is my banner. So this correlates with the story very well with Moses holding up that rod like that so that they could defeat the enemy. And that was their banner. By him standing there and exalting the rod like that and holding that up, exalting the power of God over the situation. And it was like their banner because when they looked toward that, because they could see Moses up there on the hill during the battle, obviously, and that was an encouragement to them. The Lord is my banner. Now, in Psalm chapter 20, verse 5, the psalmist says, We will rejoice in thy salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Amen. Verse 16. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation, to generation. Now I was saying there that that's why he, he named it. That's why he named the place there in the altar Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And this did happen for a few hundred years. The last mention that we see of Amalek is I believe in the book of 1 Samuel. And it talks about Saul defeating them at one point, and then later David does. And after that, there's no mention of Amalek ever again. <laughs> now, in my Bible, there was a notation in there, right next to where it said that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. It said there, that literally, that is, the hand of Amalek is upon and against the throne of the Lord. So this was a big part of it. Esau always had contention with Jacob because he, he took his birthright and he felt that he was the proper recipient of the birthright. But the Lord didn't see it that way. And then here, this time, he actually attacked them and the children of Israel were the apple of the Lord's eye. And here these descendants of Esau, Amalek, come up behind them and start attacking the rear flanks. The elderly and, and people like that who couldn't defend themselves. So at that point there is where Amalek had his hand upon and against the throne of the Lord. The overwhelming idea that I get from this whole thing so far is the Lord being their protection through all these troubles that are going through. And it's like this in our lives, isn't it? It is. Who do we go to in any problem? But like I said, oftentimes it's not when we're in the heat of battle that we can see his presence a lot of times it's afterwards when we look back on it. And then we can see the great things that he did. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for being our help in our time of trouble. And always being there to defend us and bring us through and to give us water from the living water when we need it. Lord, we give you all the glory in all of these things. We thank you for it, Lord, and we worship you. And I ask that you touch each person listening to this. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. <laughs> There's so many things that can be talked about in these scriptures. 
and all the time I'll finish one of these videos and then afterwards I'll think of all kinds of things that I didn't bring up <laughs> I'll think well I should have brought up this I should have said this I should have said that it really is impossible to bring everything into this because the Word of God is is so is so multifaceted and full of all types of depth of riches of 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 inspiration and knowledge the whole purpose of these videos is to encourage people to get back into the word of god dive into it there's so much there's so much to be found in there and there are certain sections of scripture which are read much more than others but all through the bible in all the stories in all the histories, in everything, there's all types of things to be found in there that are hidden. <laughs> and I'm trying to uncover some of them. And I hope that I'm doing that for some of you. I love you all. And I'll see you the next time around. Bye-bye. And I love to tell the story